Years ago, there was a master violinist in Europe. He would play in concerts, and he had this magnificent Stradivarius violin. Now, if you know your music history, you'll recognize that name. Anthony Stradivarius was a violin maker in Cremona, Italy, uh, in the late 1600s, early 1700s. His instruments are widely regarded as the greatest masterpieces of the craft that have ever been, they've never been rivaled. Uh, and they've done all these experiments to try to figure out when, when, they, when they occasionally come up for sale, they sell for anywhere between eight and 20 million dollars. It, it's absolute masterpiece. And he had one of these. Um, he would play it. He'd play it in these grand concert halls. And when he would play, people would say, oh, wow, listen to the sound of the Stradivarius. And he'd play it in these beautiful cathedrals in Europe, right, with stained glass and towering uh, Gothic architecture. And people would listen to him and they would say, oh, listen to the sound of the Stradivarius. And, and he played before kings and queens and they would whisper to each other, listen to the sound of the Stradivarius. And one day he was walking through the cobblestone streets in an old European city and saw a pawn shop there. Hanging in the window was a little violin. Curiosity just bit him in that moment and he walked in and he said, how much for the violin? And the man said, 10 euros. He said, will you take five? That's a deal, yeah. Uh, and so for five euros, he walked out with this little violin and he took it home and he, you know, he worked it over and he polished it and cleaned it and rosined the strings and, and, and got the bow back in order and, and he, you know, he tuned it and he just, he played it a little bit more and he adjusted the bridge and he tuned it and he played it a little bit more and he made some other adjustments and retuned it and tuned it. And then for the next two weeks, he just played the chili out of this thing. Just constantly playing this, pouring sweat and oils from his hands into this violin. He had a gig coming up, big concert, maybe the biggest one of his life. Guess which violin he took? Five euros. And he goes and he plays this violin and all the people are whispering, oh, listen to the sound of the Stradivarius. You know, maybe it wasn't the instrument, maybe it was the one who brought it to life. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Thanks for being with us today. We're continuing our series called Inked. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been considering how the ink of the Bible is way more important than all the ink that's been spilled about it. We've c encouraged you to commit portions of it to memory, and, and it, it really is significant. We're going to press into that a little bit more later. But listen, we can carry a theological library in our pocket, right? You can carry every translation in your language in your pocket, and even in some languages you don't speak. Um, and around with you, and yet it's still so significant to memorize it, and here's why. J. Philip Hyatt, who taught at the Vanderbilt Divinity School, once remarked, our Bible is not an amulet or a magical charm, but a book to be read and marked and inwardly digested and translated into life. Listen, you do not become godly through osmosis. Carrying a Bible will not make you more like Jesus. You actually have to read it. You actually have to put its words into your life. And there's a very important reason why that's true, and we're going to talk about that today. And the reason is that it is alive. God is present in his word. Before we read our text for today, let me give you a little background. This is part of a warning text. The author intends to warn his or her readers, and the reason I say his or her is we don't know who wrote Hebrews. It's not signed. The modern scholarly consensus is that it was Apollos. In Apollos, he was a, an associate of Paul, he's the one in Acts 18 that Priscilla and Aquila, note she's mentioned first, are the one who bring him into their home and explain the way of God to him more adequately. Priscilla and Aquila discipled Apollos for a little bit. All right, brilliant man, thorough knowledge of the scriptures, just needed some help making some connections. And so many have suggested that it's possible that Priscilla had an editorial hand in writing this, so hence the, the, using both genders. 
We, we really don't know. I think it was Apollos. I tend to agree with that consensus, though there may have been others. We know that Paul had co-writers, right, on some of the New Testament letters. So we're not sure. So you might hear me say he, you might hear me say they, because we, we just don't know who wrote this, okay? But the, the writer of, of Hebrews, probably Apollos, we don't know, um, is trying to warn like Jewish Christians not to go back to the law. He says, listen, if, once you've accepted Jesus, once you've, you've done this and God's word is alive in you, you can't go back. There's no going back. <laughs> you can't go back to the law of Moses. And he's telling them here in chapter 4, he says that if you have begun to enter the rest of God, the Sabbath rest of God, and that rest is symbolic for both our realized salvation here as well as the promised salvation and redemption that we will have in heaven. It's kind of a symbol of both. He says you've entered into the Sabbath rest. You can't go back to what was before. And so this is a warning. He's saying if you want to enter into this rest, God's word has to be alive In you. And the context makes it clear that the word referenced here is God's spoken word, which later gets written down into Scripture. Right? In in verse 4, he talks about God speaking, but what God speaks is one of the Ten Commandments. And so it's yes, it's the word is God's spoken word, but it, it ultimately evolves into Scripture. Okay? So that's that's the context here. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered, now note this language, uncovered and laid bare. We're going to come back to that. Before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Stanley E. Porter and Mark J. Boda in their book Translating the New Testament write this. For the author of Hebrews, God is constantly speaking to humans. In the past, God spoke through the prophets, and in these last times, God has spoken through his son. That's Hebrews 1.1. But if it is God who speaks through the words written in Scripture, then the words of Scripture are not dead texts significant only for the past, but living voices speaking powerfully to the present. Man, amen. I I read that. I was like, yes, yes, that is absolutely true. And what I want to tell you today is the same thing that Hebrews is telling you, that God's word is alive. It is active. And in a way that we probably can't really put our finger on, God himself, the presence of God is present in his word. And, And I think the second you try to narrow that down and nail it down and define it, you lose it. It, it, it's just this thing that when God, God's word is alive, it's active, and that word means he's present in it. So we help our own cause, and we promote our own ultimate good when we submit to the word's incisive power and ink it on our life. So how do we do that? Well, I want to explore this text together today. We're just going to kind of walk down through it and take our time learning from Hebrews chapter 4. It begins by using this connecting word, for. For the word of God is living and active, right? And that, in verse 12, it indicates that a crucial part of entering God's rest means submitting to his word's probing power. If you want to experience the rest of God, which again here is a symbol for salvation, if you really want to enjoy every, all the benefits and blessings of, your, of being saved, <laughs> that means allowing God's word to speak into your life. Okay, the writer says that God's word is alive and active. Now, those are probably meant to be understood as two different things, but they're inseparably linked, right? The word translated alive here, there are kind of two words for life in the Greek New Testament. One is where we get our word biology. That's not the word here. The word that's used here is the one that tends to describe life like God has life. In fact, it's usually used with the adjective eternal. And it's that kind of life that is present in the word, that there's this this life like God has. His life is present in this, all right? And it also says that it's active. His word has power. His power, the power of God is present in his word. When God speaks, stuff happens, right? Yes, how do you know? We're all sitting here (laughs) because he spoke the universe into existence, When God speaks, stuff happens. 
You know, when Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven, I tell you, get up and walk. Lame people walk. When God speaks, stuff happens. Right? We should not be surprised that God's word shares some of God's attributes. He is alive. He speaks. His word has power, right? And we shouldn't be surprised that his word is the same way. He's alive. He's active. And, and the next comparison then is very interesting because he, he goes, it's alive and active and it's sharp like a double-edged sword. Now, the sword is the, was the most uh, common weapon of warfare in the ancient Near East and the Greco-Roman world. Um, you know, anywhere from 16 to 20 inches in length. Likely what the author is thinking of here is the Roman gladius. Something about like that. Right? This would have been about what they had in mind. Um, it's the normal word for sword in the New Testament. This was the most common sword in the Mediterranean world at that time. This is just a cheap eBay replica. Relax, you're, you're safe. It's, it's not even, like, I can't, it's not, you know, this is pointy. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you remember was that scene in Zorro? Like, he says, do you know how to use that? Yeah, the pointy end goes in the other guy. Um, so that's, <laughs> you know, th this, this is probably what he's thinking of, Okay. There are about 400 references to the, to the word sword in the Bible. Most of them refer to the literal thing, right? Now, it become, because it's so common and because it was the dominant weapon of warfare, it becomes a metaphor. So to put a town to the sword means to go to war against it, all right? The sword also symbolizes divine judgment in Scripture. David describes God as a divine warrior in Psalm 7 and specifically mentions him sharpening his sword. And not only that, but you have the images of Jesus in Revelation, right? Jesus in Revelation is described as having a sword coming out of his mouth. And in one instance of the two places, it's a sharp double-edged sword. Same language here. That there's this description of God's word. Now, you need to remember, and maybe you don't know this, in the book of Revelation, the stuff that comes out of people's mouths is usually a symbol for their words, so, so you got this connection between the word of God and the stuff that God speaks and a sharp double-edged sword. You see that in Revelation. You see it here in this passage. The, the point of this is that God's word penetrates and divides. God's word penetrates and divides. That's exactly what this thing was designed to do if it were real. You know, it will penetrate. This one actually will do that. And divide. Now, what the writer is doing here is not making a theological statement or a philosophical statement about the nature of humanity. In other words, are we bipartite or tripartite? Can I get philosophical for just a second? Bipartite means there's a material, the physical form, and immaterial, your spirit, your soul, your body, your, your mind, whatever. Tripartite means that there's a, a body and a soul and a mind and they're all different. And the philosophers can argue about that all day long. That's not what the author of Hebrews is doing. When he talks about dividing soul and spirit and joint and marrow, that's, that's not what he's saying. His, his point here, get the pun, that was intended. Um, the point is that this is designed to, to work its way into the deepest places. It can separate the most tightly united things. It, can, it comes right into those, those hidden spots. In fact, that's the point, that's the purpose of a good translation. That's why we have them. And, I, you know, Roger earlier mentioned the Pioneer Bible Translator d exhibit we had last week. Y'all, if you speak English at, at all, you need to understand that we have an embarrassment of riches in our language in terms of Bible translation. Y you, you can find a translation for anything out there. It's probably like the left-handed underwater basket weavers translation. I mean, like, there's so many different things, you know, and so every now and then we'll get questions like, why do you use the one you do? We need to understand that those exist kind of on a spectrum. There are kind of two poles, right? On one end, you have like hyper literal, like we're just going to take the Greek in, or Hebrew and try to turn it into English and leave it alone, right? And on the other end, you have really kind of not even so much thought for thought, but feeling for feeling. And it's, I want you to feel in your, in your emotions the same way that the original audience would have felt, all right? So way over here, you've got like New American Standard, 
All right, and a little further in, you've got English Standard and King James Version, right? Um, and then way over here, you've got like the, the New Living Translation or the Message or whatever. Right smack in the middle is the NIV, to, I think. And so that's why I, I use that. I study from it primarily. I consult other translations. There's, and there are times you've heard me be openly critical of this. Like, oh, the English Standard does a better job here or whatever. I think it's just the best blend of the two. Right? It's the best middle ground between really literal and really figurative and, and, and you know, making you feel what the text would have you feel. The point of all of it right, is so that this can happen. The point of a translation, the purpose of putting it in your language, otherwise we'd all have to learn Greek and Hebrew and a little Aramaic. The point of a translation is so that God's word can penetrate deep into your soul because that it's, God is alive in it. And his presence is in it. And so when it gets down into you, stuff happens. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. What the author is saying here is that God's word can reach into the innermost recesses of your being, the very thing that makes you a human. Part of what he's saying is you can't bluff your way out of anything when it comes to God's word. God sees you. Sherry talked about that a little bit earlier in that reference to Psalm 40. We'll look at that in a second. You can't hide from God who you are. And so what I, part of what I want to tell you today is this. Regular encounters with God's word expose the sinful thoughts in us so that we can become more like Jesus. The, the, one of the things that is true about God being present in his word is that when you regularly encounter that, it begins to show you who you really are because you can't hide this stuff from God. That's why the idea that God is present in some way, again, that probably eludes our understanding, that's why the idea that God is present in his word is so powerful. That's why when we're reading his word, we can be brought to conviction and it's not like you didn't know that stuff. It's not like you'd never heard that before. It's just now God is in it. And it's like he's telling you. Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about being God breathed, right? So as you're reading the word, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you're reading your devotions and you wince. Oh, ouch. That hurt. <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. God is present in his word and through his word, he reveals your heart to you. And, and, and that can, it can be a painful experience. Now, going to the doctor to have him cut on you can be a painful experience. So there's a, there's a, a very important distinction here between hurt and harm. Sometimes God's word, reading God's word can hurt, but it is not with the intent to harm. It is with the intent to heal. Maybe you've been at the doctor and you go in like this hurts and he starts probing or she starts probing around on you. Does it hurt here when I do this? No. Does this hurt? No. Does this hurt? No. Does this hurt? Uh. Yeah, that's it. You found it. <laughs> Sometimes that's what God's word does for us. A man once complained to Mark Twain that the Bible was all jumbled up and inconsistent and filled with passages he couldn't understand. And the, the humorist replied, well... I have more difficulty with the passages I do understand than the passages I don't understand. <laughs> Can you identify? It's like, man, Mark, I felt that. That, that stings. Um, you know, when the writer of Hebrews wants to put forward this idea of nothing being hidden from God's sight, they're, they're simply picking up on an idea that's present all through Scripture. Again, Sherry referenced this earlier. Psalm 44, verse 20 says, if we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, that's idol worship, would not God have discovered it? Implied answer, yes, he would have, since he knows the secrets of the heart. Ecclesiastes 12, 14, here's the end of the book, right? For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. 1 Corinthians 4.12, Paul writes, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. See, in verse 13, the writer here employs some really unique language and imagery uh, to make their point even stronger. First, he talks about the, the, the thoughts of our hearts will be uncovered. You could also translate that word exposed or, or naked. 
And it's this idea of extreme vulnerability. But then there's also this word laid bare. The word is translated laid bare. It's the only place that word appears in the whole Bible. And it's a really interesting word. Um, the word is connected with the idea of our neck. The, the root of the word is trachelos, which is where we get our, our word trachea. And, and it's the, I, we don't exactly know what's meant by that. Um, some people see in this a medical connection, the idea of doing surgery. Others, uh, the, the, like I said, it's only used this one place in the New Testament. It is used a few times in the classic works of the ancient Greek world, specifically applied to wrestling. That there is this, there was this grip or this wrestling hold. I'm not going to ask you wrestling fans to raise your hands, but some of you will, like, if you're into wrestling, there was this grip or this hold that almost guaranteed victory. If you could get them by the neck this certain way, pull their head back, and that's why, again, it's the idea of pulling the head back and exposing the neck makes some people think, oh, that's medical imagery, like you're doing surgery on their chest. That's possible. That's possible. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe, though, it, it might be something else. I think that might be seeing a little bit too much metaphor in here. Micah, would you come help me with this real quick? I promise I'm not going to hurt you. Um, if you do something dumb and get hurt, that's on you. But uh, so here, here's the image I have. I might be wrong. I might be reading into this. But here's the image I have. It's, it's almost like the word has you by the neck and it's, it's going to pierce and divide. Right? I can feel his pulse. I don't blame you. Uh, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> I, sometimes I wonder if scholars hang out with books too much and don't play with swords enough. Have you ever had this experience where God's word kind of has you by the neck? And you're like, whoa. Thank you, appreciate it. Would you express your appreciation for Micah? He's very brave. Thank you, sir. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't know he was going to have, have, have his life threatened at church. Um, now, someone's going to take a picture of that and put it on Facebook. I'm like, what is happening at that church? Uh, I, I wonder if the scholars are being too metaphorical here. I think he's, he's, I think he's being a little more literal. Maybe you've had that experience where you feel like, man, God, God's got me by the neck. What is that? God is alive in his word. He's present in it. It's not some ancient dry text. It's living. It's active. And when you feel pinned to the wall and you come to church and you hear a sermon and you're like, who put the cameras in my house? That is the Holy Spirit living in his word. If you're going to do this, this is going to create in you an incredible level of vulnerability. And that's where I want to go with this today. That's the big idea today. The more vulnerable you make yourself to God's word, the more powerfully you will experience God being present in his word. And what I'm encouraging you to do is be like Micah. And go ahead and let God's word grip you by the throat. And be vulnerable to his word. Because when you do that, you will experience his presence in it in ways you've never known before. And God will speak to you through his word in ways that you've never experienced. How do you do that? How do you make yourself more vulnerable to God's word? Well, one of the surest tests that you're being formed into the image of Christ is when you read your Bible and you wince. Mm. Ow! Ooh, you know, and you, just, you, you, that's, you can tell like, okay, you really are bringing your brokenness to Jesus because you're, let, you're being vulnerable to him. And he's working. So how do we make ourselves more vulnerable to God's word? Let me give you four practical steps this morning. Here's the first one, prayer. And I know we're like, okay, we're in church. You gotta say prayer. Like, hang on. Because I don't know about you, but I'm just, I'm being really transparent here. There have been times in my life when my daily Bible reading was check the box and move on. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I bet I'm not alone in this room. In a group this size, I guarantee there's somebody else in here who at least once in your life has read your Bible that day because check, done, moving on. And what I'm encouraging us, all of us to do, and I'm preaching to the mirror here, folks, is slow down and before you even start, Pray. And ask God to speak to you. 
Ask God, say, Lord, I believe that you are alive. You are present in this word. Speak to me. He will answer that prayer. Guarantee it. Because it's a lot, it is alive. It's the truth, right? I know this sounds really simplistic, but it works. So the first step is prayer. Here's the second thing, memorization. We've been talking about this in this series. When you have God's word committed to memory, he will use that knowledge to shape you into the image of Christ. Now this has a couple different applications. First, let's go to Jesus. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, how did he fight temptation? With the word. Did he, did he drag a scroll with him out there? Nope. Nope. He had it here. And so when you're wrestling with a sin, a temptation, I would encourage you, find a verse about it, find a verse that that encourages you to fight that and memorize that dude. Or dudes. There might be more than one, right? Memorize those verses. Because what you're doing, you're simply doing exactly what Jesus did in in the wilderness. You're fighting temptation with God's word. Why does that work? Is it a trick? No. He's alive in it. That's why it works. And so when you quote scripture in moments of temptation, you are literally enlisting the power of Almighty God to help you fight it. He's present in his word. So that's one thing. But there are other things too. And sometimes we struggle with stuff that's not necessarily a temptation or wrong. It's just hard. And sometimes we wrestle with things that's not even, it's not even your mess, it's somebody else's mess. Sometimes you're being sinned against. Did that ever happen to Jesus? Uh Uh-huh. Remember this thing called the cross? So when you have to fight that, when you have to deal with that, what should you do? Memorization. When there's a situation that just feels like an intractable, like, I don't know what to do. I, I, what, how do I handle this? I don't even know what to feel right now. If you have committed scriptures to memory that help you rest in the peace of God, can I, again, just be really transparent? Lately, the 23rd Psalm has become like a lifeline for me. In, in the stresses and, and, and struggles of life, it's, again, it's one of those, like, it sounds like such a Sunday school answer, but y'all, it has been working so much. I've gone back to that psalm over and over and over again. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And in those moments when my heart is just twisting inside me, going to God's word, it's, am I being tempted? No, I'm just having a rough day. Having it committed to memory. Sometimes you don't have time to grab your phone and look it up. It just doesn't feel natural and right, but knowing it does. So have it committed to memory. The third step is this, obedience. Again, you're like, well, it's not super profound here today, folks. But, but I hope it's meaningful for you. Jesus often commends and rewards radical, unhesitating obedience to his word. <laughs> Do you remember, remember the great catch of fish? Right? Peter and the disciples are out in the boat, and Jesus says, throw your net on the other side. And, and Lord, we worked hard all night, but because you say so, okay. And they did it. What happened? They couldn't even haul it in. In fact, in, in one gospel, it says that Peter and Andrew signaled to James and John in the other boat, and they use a phrase that means to signal with the head. Do you understand what this means? They got, they got the neck, and they're like, guys, come here. There's so many fish. This radical, unhesitating, instant obedience to Jesus can change your life. I believe there is a one-to-one correlation between obedience and vulnerability. The more willing you are to make yourself vulnerable to the word of God, the easier obedience is going to get. And so when you don't know what to do, obey what you do know and see what happens. When you don't know what to do, obey what you do know and see what happens next. A couple weeks ago in staff meeting, uh, in preparation for next year's preaching stuff, I, I asked our staff just some questions about the conversations they were having with y'all uh, through the week, you know, um, and just said, I, I want to make sure I'm addressing the needs of our congregation. What, uh, what kind of conversations have you been having with Chapel Rock people? Um, and I said, what kind of spiritual questions are you being asked? 
And, and several of them talked about this discernment issue. How do I know what to do in a difficult situation? One of our staff members, and I won't say which one because I don't remember, um, <laughs> but, but they recalled the conversation with one of you, and I won't say who because they didn't mention it either. Um, but they quoted one of you as saying, here's a direct quote, I wrote it down, I read the Bible, but I just don't feel like I'm getting guidance on what to do. You had that experience? And I, I want to, I, I, please hear my heart here, I'm not trying to be flippant, I'm not trying to be obnoxious, I can usually do that without trying. Um, I'm trying to help. I think in that situation, I would, I would answer that question with a question and just say, well, are you obeying the parts that you do understand? That silence got real loud there, didn't it? Are you obeying what you do understand? Uh, okay, start there. In situations where you don't know what to do, in situations where you're like, I read and I read and I'm not getting, I'm not getting this kind of voice out of the sky like I'm looking for. It's like, well, what, what do you understand that God has told you so far in the situation? Are you doing those things? Uh, yeah, okay, start there. Let's talk about that. And then we'll go on to maybe some of the more complex issues. And, and here's really, that leads perfectly into the fourth thing, and it's the idea of community. Community. When you're participating regularly in discipleship-focused relationships with people, and you're at the level where you can be transparent and honest with those, those folks, that vulnerability will happen automatically. It's a byproduct of being in good biblical community with people. When you give them permission to speak the word into your life. When you're that vulnerable with, with others, when you're that open to them, and, and, you, and you've given them permission to go, well, you know what Paul says about that in Ephesians 6, right? Like, I don't understand why I keep struggling with this sin, well, let me take you back to the spiritual warfare passage. Are, we, are you fighting? You got your armor on? Are, are, are you armed? Because if not, of course you're losing. And that's a hard conversation to have with a total stranger. But if you're in community with people and you've given them permission, you've been vulnerable with them, now we can see some growth. Now we can see something happen. Listen, I love preaching. I love church, all right? I'll be the first one to stand up and say, even though I love preaching and I love church, I love being here with you, I'll be the first one to say that I believe that, yes, spiritual formation happens some in rows, but it happens way better in circles. And it happens way better in a situation where, where life on life and you're interacting with people who've given, this is great, and this can facilitate a discussion. This can begin the conversation but at the end of the day, you've got to be in community with people who can say, are you living according to his word? And there's a vulnerability that has to be present for that to happen. You're like, okay, see, I don't know how to do that. We are literally having a ministry fair today. Like you go out in the lobby and, and, and find that group. Like I, you can plug in just a group of believers to serve and love Jesus with and eventually, you know, that should happen. It doesn't always, I can't make any promises, but that's the hope and goal, that's what we're working for. When I was just a little guy, Andrew T. Lincoln, Andrew T. Lincoln wrote a journal article about this passage he called God's lethal weapon. And in that he writes, in a sinful world, God's word, in whatever way it comes to you, whether you interact with it by yourself or whether it's brought to you by another, can be painful. Now look at what he writes here. The Bible can be a painful book. Yet the sword of God's word uncovers your sin in order to point you to the one who bore God's sword of judgment against sin. In, to the one whose sprinkled blood speaks more graciously than the blood of Abel who has been ex, and who has been exalted to heaven as your merciful high priest. He goes on to say to experience the Bible working in your life this way is to become someone who knows genuinely and from the heart what the writer to the Hebrews is talking about when in chapter 6 verse 5 he speaks of tasting the goodness of the word of God. Did you hear me today? The more vulnerable you make yourself to God's word, the more powerfully you will experience God being present in his word. And because the word of God is alive and active when we ink it on our hearts, he is present in it. 
to form us into the image of Christ, to empower us for service in his kingdom. So I want to ask you, is he speaking to you today? I mean, I've got a couple expensive guitars, but nothing near a Stradivarius. And it, but, you know, the funny thing is, is it doesn't matter. I mean, if, if I pick it up and play it, it it's going to sound one way. But I guarantee it'd be better if, you know, Phil Kagey played it, right? Tommy Emmanuel, substitute your favorite guitar player. Like, it would, just, it would, it would ought to be better. And here's what I'm telling you. God is present in his word. And when you ink it on your life, you will experience God's presence in a way you've never known. So what is he speaking to you today? Maybe he's telling you to give him your life in repentance and, and confession and baptism and discipleship. If that's the nudge you're getting, if God's moving in your heart that way, that's God speaking. You better listen. Maybe he's saying, my child, you've carried that concern by yourself for far too long. When are you going to share it with your brothers and sisters so they can pray with you? We'd love to pray with you today. Maybe God's been speaking to you through his word another way and you want to confirm that through community. You want to visit with one of our elders in the next step room. You, you might have something else that's, that's weighing on you today. I'm going to ask you to stand with me and we're going to have a chance to respond to this message. Maybe this morning you want to come forward and be baptized. This is the time. Maybe you need prayer. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you have a conversation you want to have. The next step room is where you should go. We're going to sing and you respond as God leads you today.